DC, we're on diplomatic row, so there you have it. Um, a couple of pieces of uh, housekeeping. Uh, we're using an open format today, and that was actually um, uh, the Perrin family's request, which I love. Uh, we're not doing it, you know, sort of uh, cold hearted webinar style. But that said, please keep yourselves on mute. We have wonderful slides that you're going to enjoy. I did put all three reds in the chat room. If you've got all three and you plan on sipping them like I, spoiled person that I am, have all three. We're going to uh, talk about the Van Sobre first and then the Cinard Chopinet du Pop and then finally the Coudelet. It's going to be probably about 20 minutes before we talk about the wine specifically. So please go ahead and taste. Some of you are so beautifully well-mannered. You uh, wait patiently <laughs> until I tell you to go ahead. So uh, I want you to have too much pleasure. So that by the time you get to ask a question and we ask for them, you are perfectly relaxed. Um, other than that, uh, you can keep, uh, questions in the chat room, but I think so much information is gonna be covered, you're not gonna to have to worry about it. Um, that said, you know, there are some names in the, the wine industry, the wine culture, the wine world that are synonymous with their regions, their estates and their countries. And for me, your family parent is certainly one of those. I mean, instantly what comes to mind, um, and to your imagination is certainly Chateau de Bocastel, Chateau de Tupac, the Rhone Valley and France, <laughs> all in one breath and thought. And I just think that's wonderful. Um, we um, are very uh, privileged to welcome two visitors from France today, two friends. We have uh, Marc Perrin, it's their 10 p.m. by the way, so thank you for that. I have some crazy Italians that have been willing to stay on until midnight or one, but you can tell. <laughs> Um, we have Mark Perrin, who's a fifth generation Perrin family, uh, and he also happens to be the current CEO after having worked as um, the general manager. He's been involved in uh, Boca Estelle in, in uh, assemblage and winemaking since 1988, but he has, he might touch on his background prior to that, because he set up uh, an amazing French uh, uh, online retail operation before he transitioned to working full time for his uh, his with his family, I should say. So because I believe you have nine family members working with you now. So Mark, thank you very much for being with us. And we also are lucky to have uh, Emmanuel uh, Lemoine, um, who was you know, born and raised in Bordeaux, we'll forgive him because he's currently living in Provence and has uh, actually lived for several years in the United States um, in the San Francisco, the California market, um, and uh, has a master's in international wine trade. So the fact that you're the export director and um, your soul and heart seem happy living in Provence and working um, with the Perrin family is terrific. And we're very happy to have you here as well. Uh, Emmanuel, thank you for all your help in setting this up. Um, I would give you a snapshot of this region, but it's kind of absurd because they're going to paint the picture for you <laughs> in uh, much brighter ways than I could ever do. But I will say, you know, that um, the Perrin family really embody this region in south, uh, southeastern France. And when I think of the Southern Rhone especially, though they have projects in the Northern Rhone as well in Provence and they're, they're, they're flexing, there may be other things that Mark will tell us about. Um, I always think of, you know, what we call Rhone style blends in the United States, Grenache, Syrah, Morvedre, certainly not just Chateauneuf du Pape, but uh, Cote du Rhone. And then we talk about Garrigue, Galet, the Mistral, um, you know, Chateauneuf du Pape, the Papal Crest, um, and other things, which uh, I'm sure will be defined for you. So that said, I'm going to get out of the way. And um, my, uh, my uh, Greek uh, heart uh, welcome you very warmly to both Michigan and Chicago. And uh, Mark and Emmanuel, please take it away. We're very much looking forward to everything you have to share with us. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Madeline, um, for this introduction. Uh, so as you, as you mentioned, my name is Mark Perrin. 
I'm a, I'm a fifth generation uh, winemaker at Chateau de Beaucastel and the Durand family. And um, you know, my, my family has been in the in the wine business since 1909. Uh, at that time, my great 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 grandfather purchased Chateau de Beaucastel, which is a very old and very respected estate uh, dating back to the 16th century. Uh, and my family was not in the wine business, we were in the olive business. And what uh, business they, were they in? I didn't hear. Olive, you. olive, olive, olive oil. Business. Oh. You know, we received also the Mediterranean mm -hmm. in the Provence. And, and they basically purchased Bocastel, which was a very smart move, actually. Uh, and, uh, you know, a few things I want to, to tell you before, before, we, uh, before Emmanuel starts the presentation in which he, he did work. Um, the first thing that is very important for, for me is the fact that, you know, we are a family company. You have this picture, uh, you have my father in the middle, my uncle on the left side, uh, <laughs> and then I work with my, my, my two brothers, my sister, and three of my cousins. And, you know, now and now today, I mean, the world of, of including the world of wine, but generally the world is more and more dominated by corporations big corporations which buy back uh, almost every successful business. But we believe that the wine world is different because wine is about long term. You know, if today we can make Bocastel at the level where it is, it is by because, you know, people identified this place centuries ago as a great place to grow grapes. And then each generation make the right decisions, generation after generation about you know, how to grow the vineyards, about which grapes to, which grapes to plant. Uh, I mean, you know, so it's really a, a long-term thing. And, and the best estate in the world, most of the best estate in the world, have been established for many, many years. And the other thing is, I think that uh, when you are, you know, the, 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 you make choice for the next generation, basically. And that's why family business, in my mind, make better wines. Because when you, when you, you know, today I'm, I'm 50 years old. And when I plant a vineyard, when I made the decision to plant the vineyard, basically I know that by the time this vineyard really produce top quality grapes, it would take 30 or 40 years. So I don't do it for myself. I do it for the next generation. And basically if I was just, if I was a CEO of a public company, you know, I would try to, to get the maximum return on investment or whatever it is. But as a family company uh, member, I try to make the best possible things for the next generation. So that's a very different thing. And that's why the wine of the world of wine is, in my opinion, very different from many other businesses because you have this long-term necessity which family handle, in my opinion, much better. And we are very proud to be part of this uh, great association called the Premium Familia Evini. I think Emmanuel will mention that. Yes. Which, which, which gather, you know, family owned, family run companies. We are very proud of that. We believe that family make better wines. And so that's very important for us. The second thing which I would like to say as an introduction is the fact that, as you mentioned, Madeleine, uh, we are uh, based in the Southern Rhone. And the Southern Rhone is very specific. It's very specific for many reasons. But two of them are the fact that we love to blend different grapes in the Southern Rhone. And it's a specificity, you know, in, Bond in, in Burgundy, it's clear that Pinot Noir for the red and Chardonnay for the white, there is a little bit of Pinot White in certain extent, but basically it's a one grape area. Uh, Bordeaux, it's four or five grapes, you know, Champagne is a three or four grapes. But in the Rhone Valley, uh, we love to blend different grapes. And this is, this is uh, at its maximum in Chateauneuf du Pape, where we are allowed to grow and blend 13 different grapes. In fact, it's a little bit more because it's 13 plus the white uh, versions uh, or variants, as we may say today. Uh, so that's really important. And this is really something which is very important for us. We love to blend different grapes. And I've been trained, my family has trained me, and I've trained my kids, my, 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 my brother, my, in this kind of, you know, thing that we call assemblage, which is a very specific way of thinking of wine. It means that you make different wines, but then like a painter, which is going to use different colors, you try to create something which is bigger than each color separately. For us, each grape is like 
a color and we try to create a masterpiece uh, which is like a painting with different colors. So that's that's very important, that's very specific and basically almost all of our wines are blends and that's very unusual in today's wine world where we usually think as great varietals, you know, I want Cabernet or I want Merlot or I want Pinot Noir, you know, we, we love to blend and we think that a little bit like in life, you know, like uh, team teamwork basically, each grape is like an individual and by getting them together, we think we create something which is more interesting, more diverse, uh, more complex, and that's all specificity. Uh, the third thing which is very important for my family is we have been pioneers of organic viticulture. So my, my grandfather, Jacques Perrin, uh, basically turned Bocastel organic or maintained Bocastel organic after World War II. So that's we're extraordinary. Not... We're talking like in the 19, early 1950s, right? Yeah, we were really talking early 1950s, basically late 40s, yeah. actually, just after World War II. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's really the time when the uh, uh, chemical viticulture really started to happen, because before that, it was very uh, manual and horse, and, and, and he, he basically resisted to that. So he, he thought it was not a good idea to go into uh, uh, chemical viticulture. And, uh, and he stick to that by ideology, in a way. You know, he was very much into uh, yoga and meditation at the time. So he was huh. an early, uh, early, early <laughs> person. But he felt that it was not a good way. And, and you have to understand that at the time, using pesticide or herbicide in your vineyard was seen as a progress. It was seen as a way to improve the crop, to reduce the risk of uh, losing your crop. And, and so basically, everybody thought he was crazy at the time. But he and was really made, holistic. I mean, he was way ahead of his time. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and so, uh, but and now, you know, you, you read every day in the press that this and this estate is turning to organic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really the way to go now. But we are extremely lucky because we have been organic for 70 years, you know, and uh, that's... Uh, on top of being very nice for you because you don't, you know, drink pesticide or herbicide, you know, you have to understand that when you do organic viticulture, you have a soil which is lively, which has worms, which is porous, and which is aerated. And to make a long story short, when you have this kind of soil, the roots will go deep more easily than in a soil which is, uh, you know, uh, treated with a pesticide which becomes compacted and why it would be more difficult to the, for the roots to go deep. And in fact, as a, as a winemaker, if you have great terroir, and maybe we will discuss the notion of terroir, but if you have great terroir, which means a great complexity in the soil, what you really want is your roots to go deep. Because when the roots are going to go deep, they are going to interact with this complexity in the soil. And this is what we gave to the grape and then to the wine, its complexity and its capacity to age. So, you know, we, we love to be organic because we have a soil which is lively, porous, aerated, and to make a long story short, the soil in which the roots will go deep very easily. And that's also the reason why we don't irrigate our vineyards, because when you irrigate your vineyards, you bring to the vine the water it needs. And so the roots are a little bit lazy. You know, if they don't need to go deep to find the water, they will stay in the upper part of the soil and you will have less complexity and so on. So we are absolutely convinced that organic viticulture is not only good for you, but also and, and, and for the planet, but also absolutely necessary to produce world class wines. And we are very happy to, to, to see that now everywhere in the world, in every region in the world where people used to say, oh, no, organic is not possible. The best estates are trying to go into that direction. And it's a very good move for everybody. And you're one of the biggest organic growers in France, correct? Yes, and I think we are definitely the largest organic grower in the Southern Rhone Valley, the Rhone Valley, and one of the largest in France, indeed. That's and, terrific. And all our vineyards, all the family Perrin vineyards, uh, are organic, indeed. Mm -hmm. Actually, to be very honest, I, the thing is, I was never trained to using pesticide or herbicide, so I don't even know how it works. So <laughs> we just, we just Good. <laughs> and we are lucky because Emmanuel would mention that, but we have a lot of Mistral which is this very strong northern wind, which helps us keep everything very, uh, very uh, healthy and not have rot in the vineyard. And so, on. so it's, it's easier to do it in the run than in some other parts, but we really think it's the best way to produce world-class wine. The third thing, which I just want to mention very quickly, 
is the fact that you will see that in none of our wines, uh, I mean, we never use a lot of oak in our wines. Uh, we, we think that oak is a great support to the wine, but it cannot dominate. And so in, in Chateauneuf du Pape, the tradition, and you maybe you saw it on the picture that we had earlier, instead of using uh, small oak barrels like uh, in Bordeaux or in Burgundy, mm -hmm. we use these big oak vats that you can see. Now wash up first. Don't forget to mute yourself, whoever just centered. Just put your mute on. Thank you. And everyone, by the way, you can select speaker view if you want to see Mark more clearly. Forgive me for interrupting you, Mark. No, no, no. And so, yeah, we, we, we basically, we mature the wine in this big of that, so, which are about 4,000 uh, 4, liters. Wow. So it, it's, uh, I took my camera out. The barrel is about 225 liters, so yeah. Yeah. about 20 yeah. times bigger than the barrel. And we love this big of that for the- No, because- Someone's not muted. Can you mute yourself? I should be able to mute everyone, but I always forget how to do that. I apologize. Sorry to keep interrupting. Everyone, please check your mute button. Thank you. Go ahead. So these are not, uh, how many How many liters are they? 4,000 liters. So it's, 4, it's 20 liters. times wow. bigger than a barrel. And the, the great thing about this is that we get the benefit of oak aging, which is a slow uh, maturation of the wine without what we consider a drawback, which would be the extraction of tannins from the oak to the wine. And so we love to mature the wine into this big of that, which bring everything we want without, you know, the, the, the uh, over oak aspect, which we don't like. And also because we have uh, organic viticulture, we have a high level of tannins in the grape and we don't want to add more tannins from the oak to the wine. Well, so that's sensible, we, yeah. Yeah, and so all of our wines you will taste, uh, uh, they, they can have some oak, but it's never dominant, and that's very important for us. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Emmanuel, which, who is our, our um, uh, U.S. Uh, director and who is in charge of the U.S. Um, market for us. And he has prepared a very nice presentation with a lot of information, and I'll be able, uh, happy to answer any uh, question at the end, of course. But Emmanuel, please, if you, if you can uh, take over from there, that would be great. Thank you for that terrific introduction, Mark. Thank you. Merci, Mark. All right, everybody. So as uh, we already mentioned, this is a, a picture of the uh, nine family members currently running uh, the operations at Famille Perrin. We are basically something along the line of 200 people working at Famille Perrin. Uh, we're going to talk very briefly about the other brands outside of Famille Perrin. Uh, Maison Les Alexandrins, La Vieille Ferme, Miraval, and so forth. But the focus here are basically the three wines you're testing. And some of you might be already enjoying the Perrin Vin Sobre. Vin Sobre, very briefly, it's a small village in the Southern Rhone that is higher in altitude. So you have a lot of freshness in this wine. And it's a 50% Grenache, 50% Syrah. It's a wine that has a lot of tension and is very enjoyable in its use like this. So here's a map of France. We are here, the, the red that you see on the bottom right are basically Northern Rhone and Southern Rhone. And we're gonna focus on Southern Rhone, the bigger part here, where we're gonna be testing the Vin Sobre, the Chateau Neuf du Pape Les Sinard, and the Coudoulet. We can go on to the next uh, picture where you have <clears throat> another map with more details of Northern Rhone and Southern Rhone. Northern Rome, on the, on, the, on the tip of this map, Northern Rome are more monovarietal wines. This is more about uh, Viognier for the white and Syrah for the red. And they are very tiny villages, small appellation. It's very, very comparable to Burgundy. In the Southern Rhone, where we are gonna focus here, the main and the most well-known appellation is Chateau Neuf du Pape, but you have also Gigondas, Vaqueras, Rasto, Keran, and so forth and so forth. And what you're testing for some of you is Vin Sobre. It's one of the crew, uh, so one of the best appellation in the Southern Road. Alison, we can go on to the next one. Thank you so much. So here's a map of one of the key landmark of the area. We have few mountain ranges, but this one is the highest mount in the area. It's the Mont Ventoux. For some of you who might watch uh, the Tour de France, 
uh, they cycle on this front, uh, <laughs> and this is really one of the toughest part of the Tour de France. Mm -hmm. I'm showing you this picture because it's a key landmark of the area. We are very close to this mount, and actually we source a lot of wine uh, from a lot of vineyards, all partnership from the 60s and so forth, for our uh, very known brand called La Vieille Ferme. Some of you might call it the chicken wine in the US. Why mm -hmm. do they call it the chicken wine? Uh, many people in the US are calling this the chicken wine. For Why? Some because they don't know how to pronounce La Vieille Ferme or not uh, sure, but it's uh, actually a known fact in the trade. Many people call it the, the chicken wine. People it, well, you know, wine. I'm going to say one thing about chicken wine since you brought this up. La Vieille Ferme, and we uh, do a spectacular business with it at Plum. Yeah. It is just one of the great steals in wine. Uh, period you know if you you know some people may choose to cook with it and drink at the same time very happily so i'm going to elevate it from chicken <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you for doing so oh there's yeah. a picture of a chicken on the bottle that's why that's what somebody just said <laughs> yeah that's the reason why they call it that oh that. i was gonna say okay good <laughs> but yeah it's a it's a it's a project which was started by my father in 1970, actually, and his idea at the time was to say, okay, we have Bocastel, which is basically haute couture. Let's try to produce the prêt à porter, you know, ready made, and, yes. And, and, <laughs> and, and uh, using the same ideas, the same values, you know, the same philosophy of wine. And he started that from from nothing, and uh, and it has become a very uh, successful brand, and we are very proud of it, you know, because. Basically, producing uh, you know six thousand bottles of homage to Jacques Perrin, which is our best wine, which get you know hundred points and so on, is difficult. But pro producing a, a large quantity of wine like La Vieille Ferme at the at the level where it is is is, is really really challenging, mm -hmm. and we are very proud of it. And uh, as as for our family, we you know mm -hmm. we think uh, it's really important. And 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 many people you know tell us very often when I meet people. They tell me, oh, I started drinking French wine with La Vieille Ferme, you know, and I still drink it, you know, and, and that's really uh, pleasant for me. I love that, you know, so. I'm yeah. happy you brought it up. Thank you for leading with that, Emmanuel, because it also says that you collaborate with a lot of farmers, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, which is terrific. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So on to the next uh, picture. I wanted to show you a few pictures of the area because this is frankly a gorgeous area. Uh, this is another landmark right by uh, Gigondas village, the Dentelle de Montmirail, a very ancient limestone formation. And we make some Gigondas. We're not going to test the Gigondas today, but uh, Gigondas are really top notch uh, wines. This is, for me, the second best of the crew after Chateau Neuf du Pape. I wanted to show you uh, this picture. Uh, it became a very, very touristy place. Actually, within the village of Gigondas, which is a very tiny village, Fami Perrin uh, has started a, a restaurant that became very famous. Now, there is a one-star Michelin called Lustale, and we have, uh, and it just changed name, actually, uh, recently uh, became the club, but we have uh, the Bistro Lustale also, a second uh, uh, boutique restaurant, and we have a boutique hotel and so forth. So it's becoming a very touristy area. It's, uh, it's only uh, half an hour, 20, half an hour away from uh, Avignon, uh, the main city uh, around. We can go on to the next uh, picture. Here's oh, another see. beautiful picture in the fall, uh, very close to Gigondas also. You are on the way to some of the most beautiful villages in France called Séguré, uh, right by Sablé and so forth. We can go on to the next picture. Just to give I you love this. This is lavender fields, right? Yep, yep exactly. <laughs> now we are actually further south. We are in Provence because I would like to mention also for some of you who might not know, Famille Perrin started a partnership with uh, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie uh, at Miraval in 2012. And we produce uh, rosé, uh, some of the best uh, rosé out there uh, in Provence. So we are, um, we are also making a lot of wine in, uh, in Provence. So, um, and we make even olive oil, the olive oil of Miraval and so forth. We can go on to the next picture. Thank you so much. Here is a picture of Miraval actually, which is one of the most magnificent estate in Provence. It's uh, in a small village called Corrance, which is the very first village where everything has to be organically farmed by law. We are 40 minutes inland. It's a 2000 acre property at 1200 above sea level. 
Uh, once again, everything is organically farmed. We make wine, but we make also olive oil. We farm truffle. We have a bunch of beehives, so we make honey and so on and so on. So uh, Miraval, and we make also uh, IGP Mediterranean called uh, Studio de Miraval. And the top of that line is called Muse. We can go on to the next uh, You picture. farm truffles. Now I know why you recommend uh, truffle-based dishes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> when I was ta when I was chatting with you earlier, yeah, and we just went through the the season of truffle not so long ago. So, mm -hmm. and then in Northern Rhone, so an hour and a half north of Bocastel, uh, we are um, in partnership with Nicolas uh, Jaboulet and uh, two other guys, Sorel and uh, and Caso, and we make Northern Rhone wines also. So we make wines in Cotroti, Condrieux, Hermitage, Saint Joseph, etc., etc. So here is a picture of the Mont Hermitage. Then we can go on to the next uh, picture. <clears throat> so we're going to test 2017 and 2018. Vintages are very important because uh, when you're dry farming, uh, when you're farming organically and so forth, uh, well, you, you depend on mother nature. So 2017 was a year of all records. We had a major heat wave, uh, but we ended up with uh, perfect condition during harvest. But the wines tend to be more powerful because they were blessed with so much sun and so forth. And then the next slide on 2018. 2018 was a bit more of a tricky vintage. We had some heavy rains, but uh, at the wrong time. So. It was it was it was warm, but then we had rain behind, so we had some mildew attack and so forth. So it required more work in the vineyard, and only the families who own and run their own vineyard who can do all the job uh, correctly and perfectly at the right time and so forth manage to make great wines. And no, I'm interrupting you because this was very interesting to me. This is one of the few times that the Mistral, if I can say it, betrayed you. <laughs> you know, it yeah. didn't do the job that, uh, you know, uh, uh, you probably come to expect and depend on, which is to keep things dry. Exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. So that was more of a tricky vintage. So it yeah. required more work. And uh, yeah. yeah we, we, are, we have not seen a vintage like that since... Uh... 1943 or something. You're kidding. Oh my yeah, God. Yeah. So it was truly extraordinary. Yeah, it looked like, uh, it really looked like uh, Thailand weather. So in, 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 in September, it was like Musun, you know, so you could have rain maybe uh, four times in the day, uh, followed by uh, heat. So it was very, oh very Oh my God, awful. <laughs> usually, yeah, yeah, usually uh, for us, and that's why we are organic so easily you know is is that when we have rain after the rain we have the mistral which is going to to, to to clean everything and then we have not rain for two weeks but there it was really uh, unusual but at the end of the day you know especially with global warming you know people ke keep on keep on thinking now that the great vintages are the very dry and very warm vintages but i tend to prefer more and more this kind of uh, you know humid and cold vintages, everything being relative in the context of global warming. Mm -hmm. and, and, and to make a long story short, 2018 was very, very challenging. But I love, I really love the finesse of the wines. In huh. It's really, really, uh, and, and more and more, I like these vintages, which are, you know, colder and more humid than, than the great, considered great vintages, which are very dry and very warm. So no, thank you for bringing the paradigms it are, are swifting, basically. No, no, this is great because I was going to ask you about global warming because I would imagine that is a factor that you're considering in the Southern Rhone, correct? Yes, but you know, we are very lucky. And, and uh, in fact, in fact, the Southern Rhone has always been quite warm. And that's mm -hmm. why forever people have decided right. to blend different grapes because the blending is going to allow to balance the excess ah. of the climate in a specific vintage. Right. And, and at Bocastel, especially, you know, my grandfather, uh, well, so we, we have the right in, Boca, in Chateauneuf to use 13 different grapes. Most of the people basically recently use mostly Grenache. But my grandfather was very smart in, in his foreseeing of things and he decided to plant more and more Mourvedre. And Mourvedre is really at the northwest limits of its ripeness in Chateauneuf du Pape. But with global warming, you know, it's really producing the very best wines now in Chateauneuf du Pape. 
grape. So, so the fact of that we blend different grapes is really an asset in the context of global warming because we can play on this. You know, we can we can increase the percentage of one grape which is most more southern with global warming and reduce the, the grapes which are more northern basically. What so was your grandfather's that? name? Jacques. Jacques. So I, you know, I've, I've just uh, personally developed uh, a great respect for Jacques from it for everything that you're talking about because yeah, prescient. Yeah, if he like foresaw what was going to happen. No, no, he was a very uh, visionary, very smart guy. And you know, I always say, I mean, to make great ones, you need to understand what's going on, but you also need smart generations before you, because uh, a generation has the capacity basically to destroy a terroir. I mean, we could discuss that at the end if you want but some decision that were made by some people in some vineyards really have destroyed the terroir for, for decades at least. So you need, you need smart generation before you to keep on producing great wines, for sure. So, Alison, we can go on to the next uh, slide, please. Thank you so much. And then, yeah, the Perrin Cru, so we can go on to the next map just to show because uh, we are testing Vin Sobre for some of you guys. So within the Southern Rhone, Chateauneuf du Pape is really at the bottom of the valley and driving north, you're gonna go through the villages of Gigondas, Vaqueras, and then Rasto, and then going north and north and north. And you're gonna arrive uh, on the tip of the Southern Rhone and you are up on hills, averaging 1,200 above sea level, very exposed to the wind, uh, more sandy soil, and conditions that are a little bit more resembling the northern road. In that matter, this is the only cru, the only appellation that is allowed to have so much Syrah within its ah, plant. No kidding. That's right, because the, minim the minimum uh, is higher for Grenache and the ice. You know what? Thank you for, for bringing that up. And you also said, what? A thousand feet above sea level? Is that correct? Yeah, yeah we are averaging, averaging uh, 1,200 uh, uh, at Les Cornu. That's high. Yeah, Famille Perrin has acquired a few farms uh, right next to, the, to each other. They are contiguous, actually. And Famille Perrin is one of the largest owners of, uh, of vineyard up in Vinsobre. And um, yeah, this is really fantastic value uh, cru because it's not as known uh, because it hasn't been established for that long compared to Chateauneuf or Gigonda. So they come with better value even than uh, those, uh, those other villages. We can go on to the next uh, slide. So this is a picture of the, the Hollywood side of Vinsobre. <laughs> We can go on to the next slide. Um, so this is the village itself, uh, tiny village, uh, few, few, few hundred inhabitants, and they have one restaurant. So that's on the next uh, next. Oh picture. my God, I want to go there right now. <laughs> <laughs> this is the bistro, and uh, Famille Perrin uh, has, uh, has a guest house uh, on the next slide. That is basically uh, voilà, just, uh, just right outside of the village. And this house, uh, this farm, is surrounded uh, by the, those vineyards. And the plot that is just above the house has uh, very old vines uh, and sandy soil and so forth. So this is a picture with a little bit more of the, um, the stones and so on. It's a great diversity of, uh, of uh, terroir uh, within Vassa, but a lot of sand. A lot of sand up there. And then the next picture we have. But that uh, speaks to the diversity of the terroir too, because people always think stones galet, but there's, depending on where you are, there are pockets yeah. that are sand exactly. dominant. This is your team, correct, in Vansobra? Yeah. <laughs> this is a team that is actually uh, dedicated to uh, biodynamics that we have uh, going in. Uh, Gigondas, and then in some vineyard of Vinsobre, just above the house, where we make a, mm -hmm. another wine called Les Eaux de Julien, uh, which is uh, very ancient vines, uh, very, well, anyway, so we have this team dedicated to biodynamics that is helping us out uh, throughout the year. Uh, the next slide. What's that doggy's name is Mistral, right? Ah, yeah. Mistral, yeah. Mistral. <laughs> yeah. Right. Mark, we had yes. another one which, which was called the Truffle. Truffle. Oh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 
Famille Perrin uh, owns a bunch of vineyards uh, throughout the Southern Rhone, uh, in Gigondas, Vaqueras, Rasto, and so forth. And they own this winery that is called Grand Prébois. It's only a two, three minutes drive uh, from Beaucastel, so uh, very nearby. And uh, within this winery, uh, we centralize all the fruits that have been organically farmed by the family. And so this is uh, just to show you within the winery, those are dedicated to uh, fermentation. So we have stainless steel, tronconic stainless steel vats, uh, which are more for the um, uh, oxidative grape varietal. And then at the bottom, we have uh, the tronconic wooden vats for the reductive grape varietal. And then some of the wines can do also their fermentation within the barrel. Uh, we have, for example, Chateau Neuf du Pape, Les Cinars White, that is uh, handled in barrels like this. And then the next slide. <clears throat> Hold on just a minute. I'm going to yep. interrupt you only because I requested Good. that we show that slide. And I want to, I want to, you know, speak to everyone in language that uh, non-wine people also can understand. But, you know, we're talking about uh, smaller tanks. So truncated, right, Emmanuel means, you know, uh, cut or lower. And yep. it's extraordinary when you look at this, they are intentionally using stainless steel for grape varieties that have a tendency to oxidize and Grenache is one of them, correct? Yep, exactly. And you're using um, the older, but albeit wooden vats that have some sort of an anaerobic effect, though gentle on grape varieties like Syrah and mm -hmm. Mourvedre, is that correct? That yeah, Mourvedre and Cunoise. And Cunoise that have a tendency to be reductive, which is the yes. opposite of oxidation. So I've never actually seen a producer demonstrate this so clearly. And also everyone, I love Demi Mui because they're basically twice as big as the small barrels we're used to staring at. So forgive me for interrupting you. No problem. Well, Thank but you. I thought this was a great slide. Thank you. And then we have uh, on the next slide, a few pictures just to show you more in details uh, about the winery. And then the next slide is actually uh, the wooden vats we were talking about where we uh, um, ferment uh, the, the, the reductive grey varietal. And then on the next slide, you have uh, those um, that are actually more for aging of the wine. So it really depends on the quality uh, of the tannins, depending on the style we're looking for and so on. We either use bigger fruit, uh, bigger vats, or we use barrels. But as Mark mentioned, we don't use New York. Uh, the goal here is to soften the edge of the wine or to have the wine in, uh, in, in having more structure. It depends on what we are looking for, depending on the, the once again, about the grind of the tannins of the wine itself. And this term, foudre, is confusing to some people because it generally means larger inert oak barrels, but the capacity can vary. Do I have that right, Emmanuel? Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, even at Bocastel, uh, the, the right. very first picture you saw earlier, uh, this is a partnership that is going on with Seguin Moreau for many years, for decades, I believe. And they are handmade to fit in the room that you've seen in the <laughs> Seguin Moreau yeah. is an incredibly famous and well-respected tonnelier, tonnelier, is that correct? That, you know, a barrel maker. So oh, yeah. I just wanted to define that. Definitely. That's a, that's a so, cathedral room. Wow, look at this. Voilà. So this is at Grand Prébois. This is the room that we tend to call the cathedral because of its look. But this is where we are aging uh, most of the, 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 the Perrin wines, basically. So the Vaqueras, the Gigondas, the Rasto, the Keran, uh, and the Vinsauvre, which you're having right now. On the next slide, we have the tech sheet, basically. So that gives you a little bit more details about the wine. But as I mentioned earlier, the wine you are enjoying right now uh, is 2017 vintage. So uh, a vintage that was blessed with a, a, a lot of warmth, a lot of sun, so a powerful vintage. It's a 50-50 Grenache and Syrah. Uh, so the Grenache was fermented in the stainless steel, as we mentioned. The Syrah was fermented in the wooden vats. And then depending on the quality of each of the lots, we used either food or uh, demi mui or barrels to age and then we blended, uh, we let it rest for some time uh, in some food, and then uh, voilà, it was uh, uh, refined and, and filtered and bottled. Voilà. I want to describe what I'm perceiving because I'm tasting, actually I've been tasting it for the last you know, 20 minutes, but it's remarkably lifted and crisp. Um, 
uh, and refreshing, actually. And I think that the Syrah is presenting itself as a little more black fruit. This is very mm-hmm. defined. It's not sort of a chunky, rustic coturon. Uh, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, it's got a definition and elegance to it. By the way, somebody just asked a terrific question. This is a ton of information. You will be able to access this recording on our YouTube site. So don't scribble notes madly. Just listen to Mark and uh, (laughs) Manuel. So we'll be posting this on our YouTube site early next week. And I will send you the link to the recording. Okie doke. And more importantly, enjoy the wines. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not sure if there are any questions about Vincent or I can go on to the next. uh... Uh, I've been keeping an eye on the chat room. Does anyone want to uh, unmute and ask a question about this wine? Or do you want to, shall we just keep writing? this beautiful uh, uh, train that we're on. Don't but feel this, shy. This wine uh, being lifted, as you mentioned, with this uh, brightness and so on, it could be even during warmer days being enjoyed a little bit cooler in that matter. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, this is the kind of wine that can go on a steak salad, or you know, it doesn't have to be on a on a big heavy. Mm-hmm. Um, dish. I mean, it's it's the kind of red that I personally enjoy even at lunch. You know what I mean? So, uh, so steak it, salad. I love it with olive oil, just a little bit of lemon, salt, mm-hmm. pepper, and some dried herbs. Exactly, and then mm-hmm. off you go. Yeah. This is a wine that you can enjoy in its use, like this. Mm-hmm. You could be aging some mm-hmm. of those bottles uh, at least ten years in your in your cellar. It's going to definitely mm-hmm. age uh, very well. Okay, if there are no questions about Vincent, we can go on to Chateauneuf du Pape then. So we try uh, Chateauneuf du Pape uh, Lessinar just right after the, the Vincent and before the Coudoulé, which is a Côte du Rhône. Because Coudoulé, as you'll understand uh, if you don't know yet, uh, it's, it's part of Bocaster. It's really the best of the wines, the best value of the wines we make. And, and for me, the Coudoulé is, is a wine that you should be aging at least 10 years in your cellar before to enjoy and so forth. So uh, let's go on to the, the Chateauneuf du Pape, Les Sina. So Chateauneuf du Pape, that means the new castle of the Pope, uh, because we had the papacy established for 100 years in, in, in that village and so forth. But so uh, at first on the map you saw earlier, uh, it's basically uh, 50 different families. There might be 300 or so labels, uh, but we are at the northern tip. We are that triangle that you see that Alison's going to be uh, pointing out. We are here. Here you go. So oh. this, this is us. Um, mm-hmm. We are the northwest and northeast and border of the appellation. We are. Uh, just slightly above uh, sea level. And we are uh, on, on a flat land, I'd say, very exposed to the Mistral wind. So we have a, a microclimate and we managed to make uh, great wine uh, even uh, during those uh, uh, heat waves and droughts for many reasons, but one of which is because we are in the northern tip of the appellation. Because the Mistral is coming down from the Alps from the north, and correct? It's, yeah, it's right. a, definitely. So on the next slide, just to show you a few of the landmarks uh, that date uh, over 2,300 years. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the Roman uh, built uh, uh, in orange these gorgeous theaters that we still use for, uh, for plays and, and, and opera and so forth. Voilà. So it's uh, just a few pictures of uh, some of the Roman edifices that you have uh, in the area when you come visit and so on. Then about the papacy, so Chateauneuf du Pape, the new castle of the Pope, because they had a summer home in that village, but they had that Pope castle established in the main city area uh, called Avignon. Uh, We had basically seven popes in a row uh, established uh, in France. Uh, Pope Clément uh, started his stay in Bordeaux, then he came and established himself in, in Avignon, then Uh, One thing after the other, the popes uh, found out that uh, the wines of a very small village were greater than the others uh, for the mass and so on. So they decided to establish themselves uh, with a summer home there. And that became Chateauneuf du Pape, the new castle of the Pope. We can go on to the next uh, next picture. Oh, what a great shot. And you have to tell us why this bridge goes nowhere. (laughs) (laughs) I will let Mark explain. 
Mm. Or Ibea, maybe. He, he might remember better than I do. Mm. <laughs> it was broken during one of the war, or I don't know. Yeah, remember. yeah, yeah. It was, it was broken during the war, yeah. Yeah, the war. But oh. what's really pretty interesting is the, is the Pope's Palace that you can see here. This is, this is an incredible piece of architecture. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a I think city. it's the largest palace from the uh, 13th century still uh, uh, up today. You know, it's absolutely incredible. And I really encourage you, if you, if you come in the area, to go and visit. It's absolutely stunning. It's one of the most beautiful piece of architecture you can think of. And you have to remember it was built, you know, 800 years ago. I mean, it's crazy. It's an extraordinary it's picture. Just, just extraordinary. extraordinary. We have a close-up on the next picture. Oh. Voilà. This is the Pope Palace from the square on the front. It is, it is really, uh, uh, not, not only enormous, but this is really gorgeous. Uh, it's, uh, it's magnificent. And then we have a close-up on the bridge, the broken bridge, in that matter. <laughs> Voilà, just to show you before you get the chance to come. This is a picture of the Galerie Roulet because when you think of Chateau Neuf du Pape, you, uh, you think about those Galerie Roulet. Uh, we were mentioning those galleries, they are not everywhere. They cover only 30, 35% of the appellation. And if you come visit Beaucastel and you come to the Coudoulet Vineyard, you're not going to see the dirt. You're going to see those rocks covering the ground. They are a major component of, of our terroir. Um, so they reflect the, the light during the day, they release uh, the heat at night, and they keep the humidity in the ground. So even during drought years, uh, the, the, the vines, uh, roots manage to get some of the water because the water is stuck under those, uh, those rocks. Nobody mentions that about the humidity. Thank you for mentioning that. And those are re beautifully soft, large stones, correct? They've been around for 250,000 years or so. <laughs> and they were brought down from the Alps. Mm -hmm. They were a bunch of rocks uh, broken apart and so forth. And then that, you know, the, the, the melting of the ice created a bunch of current. Those currents shrinked uh, through thousands of years mm -hmm. and while shrinking that deposited a bunch of alluvion uh, within the Chateau Neuf du Pape area and so on. And they deposited and softened the edge of those rocks. And uh, thanks to those rocks, uh, we managed to, to, to get the, the, the Mourvedre ripe uh, the way we need to make Bocaster as good as it is. And in perfect years to make the homage à Jacques Perrin, uh, uh, one of the perfect wine of, uh, of Chateau Neuf du Pape. Uh, then on to the next. Uh, so this is just a graph about the Mistral. We were talking about the Mistral a few times, but if you have never experienced the Mistral, it's hard to understand, but it can blow up to 100, 120 days a year, up to 70 miles an hour. Holy and man. I can tell you when a, a wind is blowing that hard uh, for hours, if not for the whole day, uh, you need Advil to walk around. I mean, it's really annoying to human beings. Is it but loud? It is loud and it's extremely powerful mm -hmm. and it's cold. Uh, it gets in the way, I mean, frankly. But to farm organically, nothing better. I mean, after right. rain, it's acting as a blow dryer. It helps also in concentrating the berries, uh, which is perfect to have uh, even greater wines. And so it's a very major component mm -hmm. uh, of our terroir in that matter. On to the next slide. <clears throat> We have a picture of Chateau de Beaucastel, once again, that has been owned by Famille Perrin since 1909. We're very old vines. Uh, uh, we don't see very well, but uh, they are not trellised. They are bush vines. Uh, in Chateau Neuf du Pape, you can trellis the white and you are allowed to trellis the Syrah, but all the others, they have to be bush vines. Chateau Neuf du Pape Les Sina, which, you, uh, which I, I hope you're enjoying now, is basically a venue for us to declassify the young vines of Chateau de Beaucastel. So we harvest uh, Beaucastel. Uh, we start usually uh, mid, late August with the white, then we go on to the young vines, then we go on to Grenache and so on and so on. And then we finish with the old vines of Mourvedre. But we declassify the young vines, we make some lots, basically. Uh, most of them are single varietal, so single varietal Syrah, single varietal Grenache, Mourvedre, Cunoise, etc., etc. Some of those lots at the testing are not going 
true and they are declassified and that is becoming Chateauneuf du Papacy now. But when and you then, say young vines, you're not talking baby vines, you're talking around 15 years old, yeah, correct? Up to 15, yeah, up to 15 years old, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah definitely. Right. Um, and then there is another vineyard uh, that is actually on that picture on the top left, right by the rune of that uh, Pope Summer Home in Chateauneuf du Pape. It's just above the village, uh, right by the Clos des Papes. And uh, at this vineyard, we have uh, white, we have a, a single vineyard for white, and we have reds also, all vines of reds. And that comes also in the play of this blend. So the blend uh, is usually Grenache, Montvedre, and Syrah. And then that might vary depending on the year, what we declassify from Bocastel. But basically, uh, the bulk of the wine is Grenache and Mourvedre, and then there is Syrah. Uh, bon, sometimes there might be a bit of Cunoise or a bit of saint so I've got to tell you, the mouthfeel is wonderful. I mean, it's such a difference from the Vin Sobre. What a total pivot to something that has weight and the alcohol is a little bit peaked in a good way. You know, it lends weight to the wine and it's uh, got a nice chunky uh, uh, mouthfeel and wonderful uh, flavor. This wine really speaks to blend, doesn't it? Because you Definitely. can't pick out the components. Um, and the, maybe the, the oak uh, comes through a little bit here, but not in any new way. I just love uh, how this wine expresses richness in a way that is um, rustic. It really reflects the land. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, we have to remember we are 40 minutes south of Vincent and now we are at the bottom of the valley. So Big we are blending heat and so forth. So the wine mm -hmm. tends to be a little bit more powerful in that mm -hmm. manner. But here, I mean, this is what I actually truly love about all family Perrin wines. This is very balanced mm -hmm. and even though you are in a powerful vintage as 2017, you still have acidity. This is acidity that's going to help you in aging this wine. Uh, and that is helping you in having so much uh, tension and, and, and make it even more complex and so forth. So this wine is very enjoyable now, but you could be aging that 15 years if you wanted to. No problem it's at all. It's very balanced right now, actually. I mean, it's when you look at it and you see it's young, but at the same time, it's showing some complexity. It's showing balance. It's showing aromatics. It's not tight. Good. Do we have any picture? Uh, the, uh, do we have any questions? Sorry about uh, Lesina, or should I go on to uh, Bocaster and the Coudoulet de Bocaster? We're keeping an eye on the chat room and nobody, anyone want to unmute out of exuberant um, enthusiasm? Any comments? Norm? I cut you off earlier. Do you want to make a comment? <laughs> oh, I think this is great. As you say, it, it's got a lot of body to it. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the, the higher alcohol content, I think, uh, seems is very good. I liked it. It's also thank soft, and I like that too. Oh, thank you, Robin. The mouth feels nice, isn't it? The tan yes. is not yes. hard. Thank you yeah. for saying that. I don't, I don't think there's a chance I could store this for 15 years. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Good point. We won't make you. Okay. <laughs> and somebody just mentioned, actually, for Chateau Neuf du Pop, we don't normally talk, uh, you know, uh, dollars on these tastings, but it's an extraordinary value for Chateau Neuf du Pop because that is a category of wines, actually, that can get... Um, very pricey. So it's nice to be able to indulge in one um, a little more spontaneously. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, so we can go on to uh, Bocaster then. So Chateau de Bocaster, we can go on to the next slide. So has been owned by Famille Perrin since 1909. As we mentioned uh, again, uh, Mark is part of the, the fifth generation running this estate, this uh, gorgeous uh, and amazing estate. Um, this is a very old uh, label of uh, Bocastel, but here's a picture where you see uh, the estate. We are not uh, in Bordeaux, huh? so, so <laughs> nothing to pompous, so nothing to, you know, it's just, uh, voilà. uh, so you see those, uh, those bush vines on the front. Um, once again, uh, everything organically farmed since the 50s. Uh, this is in biodynamy uh, since the mid 70s also. We can go on to the next slide. So picture here of uh, a map of the vineyards. 
what you see in red and blue, that triangle that we mentioned earlier, this is actually the vineyards of Bocastel. And then you have that road going through the blue and the yellow. And that is actually the border of Chateauneuf-du-Pape and Côte du Rhône. Chateauneuf-du-Pape was the very first controlled appellation uh, out there uh, in 1936. So prior to that, actually, when Famille Perrin acquired this land, it was not only those 70 hectares, blue and red, but there were also some land on the other side of the road uh, that were um, Bocastel, Cru de Bocastel, until 1936. And in 1936, what you see in yellow, green, and orange uh, became uh, basically a Côte du Rhône. And uh, it is named Coudoulé de Bocastel. If you translate literally, that means the rocks of Bocastel. And that's a Côte du Rhône, but which is for me, again, the best value of all the wines we make because it's exactly the same terroir. You are on the same limestone bench with clay, sand, covered by those galets roulés. Uh, it is handled by the same people. It is handled in the same winery, using the same techniques and so forth. And uh, yeah, so. Thank you for showing this map. It really gives you chills to realize they are, you know, the same terroir, um, exactly which, the makes, same. which makes uh, Coudelet uh, extraordinary. We're on, the same, right. we're on the same level, on the same limestone benches. And then the next slide <clears throat> uh, shows actually okay. the 13 grape varietal. But what you're having now is a Coudoulet de Bocastel, which is not a blend of all 13. But when we talk about Bocastel, we talk about the fact that uh, we are one of the very few uh, to be blessed to have all 13 grape varietal. So on the Bocastel blend, basically uh, you have five uh, white grape varietals. So at the end of the day, five, six percent of the wines of Chateau de Bocaster, Chateau de Vipap are uh, white wine. But you said earlier, and this is neat to hear because some of my Brainiac colleagues like to correct everyone and say it's actually 18 grapes because some, some families like Grenache have a rouge, a gris, and a blanc, yeah. correct? Exactly. So, and we actually just got a spectacular question. I'm going to read it out. That it used to be called Cru de Coudelet. And uh, why did that uh, change? Well, because uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it was Cru de Coudelet and Cru de, Cru de Bocaster. Mm -hmm. But uh, when Chateauneuf du Pape became an appellation in 1936, the first appellation in France, actually, before Bordeaux, before everything. Uh, you could not be named a crew within an appellation anymore. Oh. So that's kind of uh, French uh, kind of politics. <laughs> and so, but you're right. I mean, before before the appellation was created, and Emmanuel showed the uh, label earlier, Bocastel was a crew being identified as a very specific vineyard, you know, for long, long before that. And Coudoulet was a crew also, absolutely. So we can go on to the next uh, slide. So as we mentioned earlier, this is a good old uh, picture uh, farming organically back in the 50s. But once again, uh, the estate has been in biodynamic since the 70s. That's uh, an extraordinary horse. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. And that's a picture of uh, some of the oldest vines on the wow. left. Uh, at uh, um, That is actually uh, for homage to Jacques Perrin. And then on the right, uh, this shows you a, a part of our vineyard. That is the historical uh, vineyard where we have uh, each of the grape varietal in a row like this, like Bourboulinque, uh, Picpoul, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, then we can go on to the next slide. So within the winery, as, we, as, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Coudoulet is handled exactly the same way as Bocaster. Uh, so the oxidative grape varietal tend to be fermented in the concrete vats that are the vats that you see in the back, the white squarish vats. And then uh, Syrah, um, Cunoise, Mourvedre, the reductive grape varietal are fermented in those uh, big wooden vats on the front. Uh, you were talking about... Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the global warming and so forth. It obviously has a lot of effect. 
um, and uh, there are many ways to 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 fight. Uh, for example, uh, recently Cesar was trying uh, uh, spraying uh, clay, uh, white clay on the leaf, uh, so we would have less photosynthesis. Uh, within the winery, uh, we, uh, for example, we have a Syrah that might be a, a bit too powerful and so on, so we're going to reuse uh, some of the stem or we might blend a little bit of a younger Grenache with those old Syrah, etc. So we have every year to find ways uh, to make the best wine possible. That's why when I, when, I, when I talk about those blends and so forth, the blends are not exactly the same. Um, every year it varies. It has to be the best wine possible. Uh, there are years where it's very difficult to make great wine, for example, uh, in 2002, we had a major flood and Famille Perrin had to decide to declassify the entire production of Bocaster. Oh if my you find, goodness. Find a Bocaster 2002, it's not from us, it comes from China maybe. But uh, <laughs> so well, there's, it, more, there's more Petrus sold in Las Vegas than is produced. So that's another story altogether. <laughs> that's another but, story, yes. <laughs> you know, but actually um, I want to bring something up because the, um, especially if we have people who are interested in the subject of natural wine, you know, this is a net organic slash biodynamic producer that is not waving the flag of natural, but is. And I think um, quite often we don't recognize that, you know, that there are some producers um, that fly under the radar, but are practicing what, the, you know, what is being preached loudly these days. So if you don't mind my mentioning that. And I also um, want to interrupt to, to invite people who have the Kudele uh, if I can get slightly, you know, a wine geeky for a moment, just hold it on your palate. Um, the quality of fruit is so evident, even though this wine is young, um, it's certainly not hard. Um, it's certainly not, um, you know, it's giving, but it is, uh, and it's perfumed and it's elegant, but I think it's inviting you to hold on to it if you can. I really think it's a beautifully crafted Cote du Rhone. You know, Thank my you. compliments. Really, Mark, it's gorgeous. Yeah. And and eight and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, was this a vintage where you had to declassify, or you lost a significant amount of? Um, of we are on 2018. We are on 2018. And yeah. yes, at Bocastel, uh, because we're in biodynamic, it was very hard to to fight um, the mildew. Mm -hmm. uh, the mildew attacked the grape directly instead of going from the leaf to the grape, so we had no time to react and so forth in some cases and so on. So the production of Bocastel Chateau Neuf du Pape 2018 is down 60%. Six zero. Yeah, six right. zero. Six zero. Sixty. So that was a very tricky. Uh, to right. So um, that's okay. We don't have to cry as consumers. We can go and drink Kudele <laughs> happily. Yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely. Um, so either uh, Kudule, Bocaster, Hommage, the three wines, when the family has decided on the, on the final blend, uh, are aged in this room. We were talking about this room earlier where we saw the picture of the, the, the family, the very first slide. So those vats uh, from Seguin Moreau that are handmade to fit in this room varies from, I don't know, 3,000 or so to 7,000 liters or so. Um, so obviously these woods are, are, are breathing. So we have this uh, angel share of two or three percent. So that's why we have a bit remaining of each of the wine in barrels just to top off. Uh, oh, these guys here, the smaller ones, right? Yeah, the smaller in the middle, barrels right. yeah, on the, in the middle, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so Kudule is aged uh, six months, usually. Uh, Bocaster is aged 12 months, and Hommage à Jacques, Jacques Perrin uh, tends to be aged uh, 18 months. But so, once again, uh, no New York, no small barrels, no, uh, you know, so no makeup on the wine. Huh? It's really uh, in order to soften the edge of the wine, to help in the wine uh, to carry uh, also uh, through time after and so on. And um, yeah, so this is good. Uh, next slide. Voilà, so this uh, is the text sheet of uh, Coudoulet de Bocaster. 
So once again, we are here on Côte du Rhône because it's just on the wrong side of the road. It's a blend of Grenache and Mourvèdre, primarily, <clears throat> with Syrah and Sinso blended together. Somebody mentioned that they have a 14 vintage. Uh, and I find it very interesting to think is they're uh, mentioning a florality because this wine, even the 18th, smells very floral to me. It's very pretty. Maybe it's because I was staring at the picture of Lavender Field, but uh, I love it. It's very pretty. And uh, they're asking for a comment on the 14 vintage, if you don't mind. Um, can either of you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, uh... You know, Kudule can age incredibly well, so mm -hmm. I'm not surprised it's 14, mm -hmm. 14 drinking beautifully now. Uh, 14 was a kind of a challenging vintage. It was not really warm, it was but some rain. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, it is a perfect spot. I mean, we are eight years, eight, ten years for Kudule is just perfect. You know, it's when, when you get the complexity of aromas, you know, not, not primary, secondary. You go basically from the mm -hmm. fruit to the soil. And that's where wine really becomes really interesting for me. You know, fruit, you can have fruit in every wine in the world. But when you get to the soil, when you get into the, uh, the truffle, the, uh, the, uh, the leaves, the, the forest after the rain, the kind of smell of forest after the rain, the potpourri, I mean, when you get into that, wine really becomes interesting. And, and, I've done that 14 Goulet for some time, but I'm sure that's where, more or less where we are now. Mark, do we have to worry about these wines shutting down or do they stay open as they mature, if you don't mind my asking that question? No, I mean, for, for the white, yes. For the white, especially the Roussan. The Roussan, you know, is beautiful for a few years and then it's going to close down and then we have to wait at least five years before it reopens. But for the red, not, not really, I mean, it's, it doesn't happen. Uh, yeah, it's true for the white Swiss. I know everyone that we're running a little late, but you can tell why I don't want to. I don't want to cut this conversation down. And I think Emmanuel is about to tell us about what the future holds, which is extraordinarily interesting. So I hope you hang tight. No question about Kuduli. We can go on to the next. So I let uh, actually I should let Mark uh, tell you more about. Uh, this uh, amazing project. Uh, yeah, well, you know, we are, we are, we, we need more space at Bocaster. <laughs> we, we, we love to, we love to store wines and age it in our cellar before we release it. And, and so, so we have a big project of renovation and extension of uh, the estate, but we, you know, our, our, our uh, uh, focused on uh, uh, sustainability we are and, uh, everything we do about organic agriculture and so on. So we really wanted to create the most, um, how can I put it, sustainable winery ever created, basically. And so that's a project. We are working with an Indian architect a studio. Uh, Her name from, is Mumbai, right? Yeah, from Mumbai, right. yeah. Right. Uh, because, you know, they build things in the old way and we love that. And they had a lot of fabulous ideas and for instance, one of the ideas is to use the wind that we have. So we are creating some, uh, I don't know the words in English, but some uh, tree, how do you call it, tree? I, mean, uh, um, I don't know. But basically what, what we do is that we are capturing- A wheel. We are capturing the wind that we have and we are building some uh, swimming pools, not swimming pools, we're not going to swim into them. Which will be below, uh, which will be about uh, 18 feet below earth level, and uh, in the dark, and and we are going to have the wind go on top of the water, and this will exchange the heat between the wind and the water, and this will allow us to cover about 90 percent of our need for uh, cooling down in the winery. So it's but this really is good. done without the use of energy, correct? This no is energy. done. No energy. no energy, which is extraordinary. And yes. what is your what is the what is the time frame on this? Is this being so we worked are starting on? Work, so we got all the permits and everything, and we are starting the work in May actually. So we are absolutely in the process of it. But it's going to be one of the most advanced, sustainable wine buildings ever made, and uh, it's extraordinary. And we were extremely lucky. We, we did a big uh, architectural contest. We had really really uh, world famous architects. We pitched for it uh, from everywhere in the world. And we are very happy that we, uh, 
the selective V sperm, which is really, really incredibly smart and which builds in a way which is quite ancestral in a way, you know, because the, the, all the construction business has moved towards standardization now. And people use, you know, pre-built materials and whatever. But here we, we go back to what construction was before and we love that. So basically, basically all the roofs of the new, new winery will be made from the clay that we will excavate to build the vineyard, to build the winery, sorry. So it's, it's kind of a crazy uh, thing, but it's really, really interesting. That's a, a really extraordinary and very exciting. And when do you project this being completed? How long will well, it, it take? Well, it will take at least two years. Mm -hmm. That's what they tell us. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe three. Uh, but uh, yeah, we are in the, really in the process of it. We got mm -hmm. all the authorization and we are ready for it. Thank you. We'll look forward to seeing that come to fruition. It's very exciting. And um, you're going to tell us about um, the, uh, the family of uh, uh, European brands. Ah, yes, I wanted to see this. I forget the name of it. What's the acronym for this, Emmanuel? P PFV, Premium Family Vinay. Mm -hmm. And so I'll let Mark explain, but uh, is it clear? Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a group of uh, family-owned, family-run companies. As I said, uh, as an introduction, we believe that families make better wines because they think long term, the wine is about long term. And uh, yeah, we are part of this association where you see some of the most famous wine names in the wine world. I mean, uh, Mouton Rothschild or Vega Sicilia or Egon Muller or Antinori or San Guido, Poroge, Cimita, I mean, all of them are more, most, more famous than the others. But what is really important is that it's, it's really family owned, family owned companies and we believe it's very important in the in the world uh, today, which is more and more dominated by corporations, which can you know by the quarter or the year and the stock market and all that. Here, I mean, we think long term. We train each uh, family's kids. Uh, you know, we have the <laughs> call that they have the PAV MBA basically. So you're going to spend uh, three months in each of these wineries. You know. And uh, we do that for our kids, and it's fantastic. And we are very close. So, do you collaborate with the other wineries? Is that is that yeah, something yeah, yeah. active? Yeah, we a lot. Yeah, we change That's a lot. fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Lucky That's children, good. you know. Lucky children. Yeah. Lucky yeah. children. It's, a good, it's a good start. Yeah, it's a good start in your life. Yeah. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. The next slide, Emmanuel. This is something that was important to me that we show everyone because you know we're all visual. And these are um, the Perrin labels that you'll find uh, celebrated in the, um, at Plum. And did Miraval change their label? Is that the new label for Miraval? Or has it been established? It's we, have not been, we have not changed the label. The, the label you have basically uh, on the left, the round one, mm -hmm. is the main cuvee. This the one. one in the middle mm -hmm. is our second wine. It's an IGP mm -hmm. Mediterranean studio by Miraval. Mm -hmm. And then on the right is a brand new project. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a champagne. Oh, a champagne. champagne. Yes, huh. it's called the Fleur de Miraval. Has this, been, has this been released in the US? Yes, uh, only very few bottles. Mm -hmm. Uh, made it uh, to the US. It was a very, very uh, small production. I let uh, maybe Mark uh, tell you more about this uh, very tiny... Uh, yeah, we have, we have basically created the only champagne house which focuses exclusively on rosé. And we did it with Pierre Peters from Le Minix sur Roger. Which is no kidding. Company. So yeah. a grower champagne producer. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Uh, we are partners and uh, we produce... Uh, the, the aim is to produce the, the, some of the very, very best champagne was a, ever produced. So. And when can we look forward to seeing that in our markets? Maybe in a year? Uh, yeah, I guess so. I mean, uh, should be uh, should be soon. Yeah. Uh, because you've got you've gotten our interest, and somebody asked about the Lafier. Uh, we didn't put the Lafier Ferme label up here. Yeah, uh, here the, we go. Where is it? In the uh, in just below Bocastel. Just below book. Oh, here it is with the chicken. <laughs> it's actually, I'm going to correct us all, a rooster. So how do you say rooster in French? The cook. The cook. <laughs> there you go. Um, 
uh, if you don't mind, we had a couple of questions on uh, regarding your favorite food pairings with the wines from this area. But before I forget to do this, Allison, do you mind if I share my screen? Um, no, not at all. Let me close Alice out. Alice says we have Fleur de Miraville in Chicago. Yay. Uh, and a final shot of the family. I'm sorry I cut that off. Uh, but I want to, if you can hang for a little bit longer, we are going to go from um, a celebration of the modern old world to a celebration of the classic new world uh, in two weeks. And we're going to have a couple, uh, Jeff Pizzoni and Bibiana Gonzalez Rave. Uh, who make wines uh, together and separately. And the uh, Pizzoni family is certainly celebrated, famous for their vineyards uh, in the Santa Lucia Highlands. And uh, Bibiana makes uh, stunning wines uh, from Sonoma. And if you are in love with, by the way, Sauvignon Blanc, their, uh, their ultra premium venture called Shared Notes is just staggeringly good uh, Sauvignon Blanc. So I wanted to mention that, uh, but I would like to see if either Mark or Emmanuel want to um, mention anything about their favorite uh, dishes, their personal favorite dishes, because we've had a couple of questions about food. Well, you know, the, I think the, the wine of the Rhones are quite versatile uh, and, and they go well with, because there is not too much oak tannins, they go well with, uh, with, with food, but uh, my personal favorite, you know, I, I love lamb. I love lamb, especially when it's roasted by the oven, the wood, <laughs> wood, wood oven, that's the way we do it. And uh, to be honest, uh, having a great bottle of Bocastel with a, 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 a lamb uh, roasted by the wood fire, you know, and which you, which you feed with uh, uh, olive oil and garlic and rosemary when you cook it, for me, uh, that's uh, that's one of the great things that I love. You know? Well, this is a Greek you're talking to, so Arnisto Furno, which is uh, lamb, um, you know, cooked just the way you're talking about. By the way, I just got a message uh, from your team saying that Plum has uh, the Fleur in Michigan as well, exclusively in Michigan. So those of you who are excited to try a collaboration with Perrin and a grower producer of Champagne, Pierre Peters. I'm going to get a bottle of it for myself. Emmanuel, any uh, dishes you want to mention? Well, um, I have to admit, uh, when I think about those pairings, uh, uh, we already exchanged on those, but uh, I, I prefer wines with age. So every year I buy some wines from Perrin, but uh, I love the Gigonda Slagil. I love Coudoulé. So every year I buy at least one case of Coudoulé. And I like to drink my wines with at least 10 years uh, or so. Mm. So I like Rack of Lamb uh, on those wines. Rack of Lamb. Uh, mm -hmm. voilà. And yeah, we just did the uh, truffle season. So I have to admit that uh, we had a lot of fun with, uh, with truffles, you know, uh, uh, buried under the skin of, uh, of a chicken or whatever have you. But uh, uh, when, you know, Syrah, when it's young, can be a bit tough. Uh, it can be uh, uh, quite spicy and so forth. But with age, it brings truffle notes and so forth. And you have 10% also uh, uh, within Bocastel. And you have a bit more uh, within Coudoulet. And, and it, it comes really on the forefront with, with age also. And, uh, and I like, I, I like this uh and tertiary notes and so forth and, and so if we can't indulge in truffles just to remind us all we have mushrooms right and somebody earlier was mentioning that they were cooking mushrooms i think with gnocchi or possibly risotto um yeah. i want to ask our team um who's been to bocassel denny do you want to make any comments about your experience there or rod um you know i have a stone <laughs> it's on my desk i will say that Oh, we had the good fortune of uh, visiting in the uh, fall of 2019 and spent two days at Bo Costell and the surrounding area, and it was memorable. Uh, it's really nice looking at those pictures and knowing that you walked that walk, but uh, beautiful property and uh, very, very cordial people. Uh, and you can't say enough about the wine or the family tradition. Uh, Coudelay to me has always been the great bargain in Rhone wines. And it's one of my standard recommendations uh, when people are looking for something reasonably priced 
yet special for Thanksgiving. Um, Denny great. is our is one of our beverage coordinators, Mark, and he has uh, been with our company for ten years now. Correct, Denny? Let's and not get into that. No, let's not get into that. <laughs> well, me too, you know. But uh, yes, he was yes. really excited to visit uh, your property as one of the. Um, the great um, uh, classic uh, French estate. So thank you for staying on and making comments. Does anyone else want to speak up about their experience or have any questions? Because we haven't given you a lot of room to talk, though the chat room has been going strong. Madeline, I like the Cadoulet for a breakfast wine. <laughs> <laughs> you would, Norm, you know. <laughs> You know, fried eggs, mushrooms, to, uh, grilled tomatoes. Okay. Great. Great. Idea. I'm lucky for I'm cooking rack of lamb and sauteed mushrooms tonight. I didn't even know that. So well, you're we'll here. Okay. <laughs> Robin, bravo. Norm, Norm was always very adaptable. Mm -hmm. So, so Pam and Phil Superfisky would like to say hi to Norm and Robin. We miss you guys at the wine tastings, as well as Denny and Madeline. <laughs> We'll be able to start these, you know, sometime vaguely in the future, you know, hopefully before next year. But, uh, you know, this is not bad. I mean, look how intimate this is. And frankly, I'm so grateful that all of you join. And this is truly, Mark and Emmanuel, one of the very best sessions we've had. So from my heart, thank you so much for your patience um, and your generosity in doing this with us. Oh, you thank know, you. It's, it's very special. And um, we're happily trudging into the future with Perrin and Champagne and Provence and whatever else you think up. And we should mention your, you know, Bocastel's collaboration with Tablas Creek. So there is a connection to California as well. well and thank, thank you, you to the rest of the Vineyard Brands team. For, for your time, everybody. And uh, it was a pleasure. And I hope uh, next time you can uh, meet uh, for real, you know, either. <laughs> uh, where you are in the U.S. or, or in Bocas. So thank you so much and uh, have a great day. Oh, you're very welcome. And Denny, what were you saying? The Vineyards brand team was instrumental in this uh, coming off. Yes. Case, I, won't, uh, I won't mention names, but they know who they are. Oh, well, I'll say Carrie and uh, Andy and Allison in the background were sort of essential. Thank you, everyone, for your company, your patience, and you can look forward to the link being emailed to you early next week. Uh, so you can watch it again if you feel like it. And thank you for supporting Plum and Perrin. Um, have a wonderful, it's still sunny outside. You can go take a walk. <laughs> again, thank, thank you, you, Mark and Emmanuel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Best wishes much. to everyone. Thank you. See you in a couple of weeks.